For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in one body, each of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We need to get better at that, guys. It happens every week. Good afternoon, everyone. Amazing. Um, yes, all right. Um, I'll start in the same way that I started in first service, um, by admitting something. I am absolutely knackered right now. Um, so I'm going to need your help and encouragement and prayers during this, um, during this preach. And in fact, I'm going to start off by praying for us all. So why don't you close your eyes, bow your heads, get your heart in the posture to receive from the Lord. Jesus, we're thankful. We're so thankful, Lord God, for who you are, for your compassion, for your love, that, that love that is greater than any love we've ever experienced, that no one's ever known, this love that would have you lay down your life for us. Thank you, Lord God, that you didn't remain in the grave, but you rose up, and that you have all authority in heaven and on earth, Lord God, and it's to you that we come today, Lord God forsaking all our agendas, Lord God. We come to you. King of all kings, we come to you. Thank you, Jesus, for this time that we have in your presence, Lord, and I pray that you would touch us, that you would speak to us, that you would change us, Lord God. As you've already begun to do, Lord God, through the time of worship, Lord God, would you continue that and change us, Lord God, that we'll be more like you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, there's a reason why I'm tired. Um, I've spent the last 10 days in Mexico, which has been great. Um, anyone ever been to Mexico before? Oh, a couple of people. Okay, so you're going to know what I'm talking about. Uh, it is an incredible place. Like, I think it's one of the, it was one of my favorite countries I've ever been to in my life. Um, we're staying just outside of Mexico City, and I travel for music. Um, I'm a musician, so I, I get to go around the world and stuff. And man, I was like kind of camping in the middle of like a jungly forest thing, and it was like mind blowing. As soon as you touch down in these, you know, a different country, the first thing you notice is the weather. It's like gray. It's not gray. There's actually colors in the sky. Um, it was like 30 degrees every day which is, is a bit of me, if I'm being honest. It was, it was perfect. Uh, the food was good. Um, I didn't realize I was into tacos like that. But rah, they, they know what they're doing. They really know what they're doing. Um, everyone in Mexico can dance. Um, I've never felt so inadequate on a dance floor before. Um, yeah, when the salsa comes on, it's, it's, it's game over. Um, it's incredible. It's an incredible place. But any time that you travel, you go to a different country, the thing that will stick out most to you is culture. Like, how are people in that country? What do they do? How do they speak? How do they, how, what do they value in their culture? And whenever you go to a different culture it, or a different country, what happens is you recognize their culture and then it highlights certain things in your culture. Right? So every morning I would wake up, I would unzip the tent, I'd step outside, you hear the birds chirping. And very quickly, there would be a little Mexican lady. I'll say, Buenos dias. And I'd be like, Buenos dias to you as well. Like, it's every, every morning I'd wake up and I'm there waving at people, saying, 
Bueno dias. I got a little bit, you know, I got a little bit confident, started throwing in some other words in there, like, hola. <laughs> you know. <laughs> it was, it was, it was so amazing. People were so friendly. I mean, there was one point I was sitting down and this guy came up to me. He just tapped me on the shoulder. He said, yo. I was like, yeah, like, you good? He's like, yeah, just check in. Are people treating you well? I was like, yeah. He's like, yeah? Because here in Mexico, we want people to be treated well. I just want to make sure you're having a good time here. My goodness, all right. And it highlighted some things about UK culture. <laughs> you see, because I came back on Friday and I thought, let me go and get a haircut quickly, look presentable for Sunday. And I'm walking down the road, this lady's walking towards me, and like a fool, <laughs> I smiled at her. And she gave. She, like she would start with like, what's wrong with this guy? She held her back and she rushed past me. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. And like, mate, I'm not trying to slight, like, I love London. My favorite city in the whole world, but we ain't got that. We, we, we're not, you know what I'm saying? We're not that. We're, we're, we're busy. <laughs> Culture, we, cultures around the world, Again, having the privilege of going to so many different countries, you see cultures will always swing from one side to, towards one side of like a pendulum, if you like. There's certain categories that actually act like uh, uh, it's like a continuum of one thing to another thing, and a culture will fit somewhere in between. What am I talking about? Uh, it's things like certain cultures will be more materialistic, and other cultures are less materialistic. Um, I've been to Miami before, it is scary how. Uh, materialistic a place that Miami can be. Like when I was there, it, Rolls Royces, Lamborghini, all of these cars are driving past. Everyone looks incredible. Everyone's in great shape. The sun is shining. Everyone's wearing designer, top to bottom. And I asked someone, how is it to live here? And she, they were like, it's good, but you feel so self-conscious. Materialism. Cultures will swing from one side to the other depending on what country you're in. Whether a country is reserved, like Japan, very reserved, very respectful, or expressive, like Nigeria. <laughs> I was saying in first service, I think every single person needs to go to uh, the airport in Lagos once in their life. It, it teaches you about yourself. Unlocks parts of your being you didn't know were there. But um, either the airport or the embassy, one of the two, please do it. Um, some cultures are more confrontational. Something goes wrong, they're straight in. Other cultures, they're a bit more agreeable and they're not really trying to cause a fuss. Some cultures are more task orientated, some are a little bit more relationship orientated, like Mexico. Why am I telling you all of this? We're in this series called Living Sacrifice a living sacrifice, where we're, we're looking at what does it actually mean to be a living sacrifice? And we did this in the first sermon where it's like, a living sacrifice, you are offering yourself, you're giving your whole of yourself, not 50, 60, 70% of yourself, the whole of yourself on the altar for the Lord Jesus Christ. My life belongs to you. I'm crucified with Christ, no longer I who live, but him who lives, Christ lives in me. That's what a living sacrifice is. Now, how do we do that? We do it, we, we, act, we act out our lives as living sacrifices by this thing called the renewal of our minds. Why do we have to renew our minds? Because if we don't renew our minds, we'll end up conforming to the culture. So why am I telling you about all of these different cultures and how, and, and how different countries will find themselves in a, in a place between two uh, characteristics? Why am I telling you this? Because we need to know the culture that we're in. Because we're going to need to know the things that we're likely to conform to. Am I making sense? So where does the UK fit... Where does London fit on a continuum of certain categories? There's two categories that I want to pull out today, and then I want to talk about how we are meant to act as Christians in, in light of that. Uh, the two categories are this, individualism and collectivism. Nice big words to make me feel smart. Some cultures are individualistic. Some cultures are collectivistic. I think that's the word. What does each one mean? Collect individualistic means a community that prioritizes the individual over the collective group. Characteristics like individuality, personal goals, independence, self-reliance, self-sufficiency, and privacy. Some countries are like that. They value these things. 
And then other countries are what you would call collectivist countries, where it's the opposite of individual. It's they, they, they prioritize and value the group over the individual. There's more unity and harmony and increased feelings of support and things like that. A stronger sense of empathy in these countries. The whole is more important than the one in these countries. Out of the two, individualistic and collectivistic, which one do you think the UK is? Let me, let, let me show of hands. Who thinks collective? Wow. Not a single one. And who says individualistic? Okay. And the survey says, can we see that map? From red, collectivist, all the way down to dark blue is individualistic. As you can see, <laughs> yeah, Great Britain, not even, no, not even the whole of Great Britain, England <laughs> is basically black. You can take that down now. Now, I knew we were in an individual kind of society, but when I was doing my reading and research, uh, the people that do this kind of thing, they, they, they think that we're the top four in the world, most individualistic countries. Top four, which is scary. We are in a very, very, very individualistic society, which means as Christians, we need to be aware. Because the ideals and the things that are promoted in our country and society will, by diffusion, almost without us noticing, will just trickle into our own lives. But we're not called to conform to the culture. We're not called, in fact, we're called to renew our minds against the culture. True, there's going to be some things in both sides, on both individual and collective, that maybe adhere to Christianity. But we are not individualistic or collectivistic. We are meant to be kingdomistic, if that makes sense. We're from a different place. Our citizenship is in heaven. Which means whatever society is perpetuating will not be the full measure of what God wants you to be or do. Why am I making that point? I'm making that point because very often we will see or we will read the idea of being a collective society. And you will think, yeah, of course, that's what Christians are meant to be. We're meant to be collective. Mm, not quite. Because as much as it's about unity and harmony and togetherness very often there's a suppression of the individual where your uniqueness is turned down. Where, yeah, 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 cool, we get it. You've, you've got that thing, but we don't care. It's about the group. So you just, I don't like the way that you dress. We're going to start dressing like this. All the diversity, it stops being celebrated. So as much as it sounds like, oh yeah, unity and all of that, in the world it gets perverted quite quickly. And become something that can be almost cultish. And individualism, it sounds terrible at first, but there's some good parts of the culture. Like I just said, London celebrates diversity maybe like no other city in the world. Just walk down Wood Green High Street. Genuinely, you see... Next time you're walking down Wood Green High Street, just... Just very to take a snapshot in your mind and think, how many countries did I just see? You see the whole world in about five seconds. It's amazing. And as Christians, we know that we're meant to be people that we, we celebrate diversity. Heaven's going to be so diverse. We love multiculturalism. So where do we fall in the continuum between the two? Like I said earlier, we're neither. We're different. We, it, kingdom living transcends whatever the world would offer up as a cultural barrier. It's different, it's other. Paul tried to illustrate this uh, in Romans 12. So this series, if you're new to this series, we're walking through Romans 12, being a living sacrifice. He says in, I'll read from verse 4. He says, for as one, as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though are many are one body in Christ, individually members one of another. Uh, the, the Bible reading that we heard earlier from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and if you're following me today, uh, just stay in 1 Corinthians 12 because I'm going to be basically going through the whole chapter. Paul, he expands on this analogy. And he says, each of us is like a different part of the body. 
We're all one body, but we're all individuals within that body. Uh, uh, you get the idea that some of us are fingers, some's hands, some are arms, some are, are, are the face, some are the eyes, some are the... Everyone has a different part to play. And he illustrates here and says, you can't be looking at other parts of the body wishing you were that. If the whole body was an eye, we'd be in trouble. Everyone has something different to bring to the table, but we're part of one body. So what it feels like is that Paul is trying to show that, yes, we are collective as in we are one body but we are individual we are individual parts of that body and the individual parts are really important and sacred and beautiful in fact the most beautiful and sacred parts we 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 are the the things that maybe we cover up more than more than usual because they're so beautiful but but then we take that and we have to be part of this thing that is the collective we have to be part of something that supersedes us it's not about us he says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It kind of culminates in, um, chapter, sorry, in verse 27 where he says, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Are we collective? Are we individualist? We are kingdomist. Amen? It's different. Now we're living in a society that is trying to tell you how amazing it is to be a body part whilst also telling you to neglect the need for the rest of the body. We live in a society that would push you to try and find your, uh, your value in your individuality. But what the Bible suggests is that your value is not to be found in your individuality, but your, fa- your value, your purpose, your identity is to be found in Christ who is the head of the body that you are part of. Is everyone still with me? Society is pushing something on us. And it has been doing for a really long time, especially in our context. Saying that we are to be strong and independent. It's kind of, I remember how old, I must must have been like five years old or something like that when Destiny Child dropped that song, Independent Woman. Is that the tune? All right, not that I listen to Destiny Child because I'm a big man now. But (laughs) I remember so, so often in pop culture, things come around where they are talking about how strong and independent and solo when I don't need anyone else. Men and women, by the way. We have this infatuation with being self-made. No one helped me. I grinded for this on my own. Now look at me. This is what a psychologist says, who's not a Christian, by the way, but she says this. The biggest lie is this. Be independent, self-sufficient. You don't need anyone. You'll be fine. You've got this. It's not how we are designed. Human beings are designed biochemically for connection, designed to be codependent, designed to love each other, designed to live in tribes. Never in history have we not lived in tribes. It takes five or six people to raise a child because that's how much emotional connection they are required to have. We now live in a hyper-independent society that is totally individualistic and teaching everybody that you'll be fine. You've got this. Self-improvement, self-esteem, self, 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 and nothing to do with the group. We don't have the resilience we need because we're encouraged to be solo. How true does that sound? And she's not a Christian. That's the culture we're in. Meaning that that's the thing that we must fight conforming to. So this sermon, in a sentence, what am I trying to talk through in the next, you know, 20, 30 minutes is this. is how do we live in a way that celebrates our individuality, yet prioritizes togetherness and unity? How do we live in a way that recognizes the beauty of being an individual member? but doesn't stake our whole lives on that, but rather takes it and lives as a sacrifice as part of a whole body. First, I want to look at the beauty of individuality because some people think that it's wrong to kind of speak about how, uh, about us as individuals. But let's see how the Bible talks about you as a person. This will help us to understand how individuality has been distorted by society. Number one for you, if you're taking notes, the beauty of individuality. And the first point here is this, that you are intricately made. And everybody said, 
Amen. You are intricately made. Psalm 139 is probably the most famous psalm that talks about you and how you were formed and gives glory to God for that. Verse 14 says, I praise you. Listen to this really carefully because it's beautiful. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from, from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. How, how amazing is that? It's a well-known passage of scripture. You've heard it before. You've probably tweeted it before that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. But have you ever really just stopped and thought what David is saying in that psalm? He's saying that there is no such thing as an accident. You are not an accident. There's no mistake human. There is no ugly human. You are woven together. My wife's recently gotten into like embroidery, which is strange for me. I can't do it because you have to get a thread and put it through a needle, which is the first hurdle. And I do not have the patience to do that. Then you take this needle and you start weaving it, following carefully lines, carefully, carefully, carefully. Bit by bit, bit by bit, putting this thing together until you have a beautiful image. The God of the universe who spoke everything into existence, a vast universe that scientists can't get to the end of. Innumerable amounts of stars and planets and galaxies. And one of them was called Earth and he put water on it and land and he spoke and things happened. But when it came to you, he took out his needle and thread and intricately wove you together. You were in his mind. He thought about you before your parents thought to have you. You were in his mind before you were in the womb. Why would the God of the universe, who is suffering and above all, take such delicate time and care? How beautifully he made you. I studied physiotherapy at university, which means I like the human body. So if you would humor me for two or three minutes... I've collected a few facts about the human body that just blow my mind. And to me, show how beautifully and wonderfully we really were made, are made. Are you going to humor me for a few minutes? You have between 100,000 and 150,000 hairs on your head. And the Bible says that the Lord God knows every single one of them. I heard that we grow 1.1 inches of hair per minute. Not one strand, but collectively all the hairs added together every minute that is happening. And like I said in first service, that is for most of us. <laughs> you ever thought about the fact that you can fall over, graze your knee, and your body will just produce a natural plaster for you? called a scab, to stop you bleeding. During the last one minute, your heart would have beat 72 times. Five liters of blood in the last minute pumped through your veins and arteries. You would have blinked 20 times. 600 million bits of visual information passed through your brain in the last one minute and 12 quadrillion signals were sent through the neurons of your brain in the last minute. And the best bit about it all is that you didn't think about a single one of those. It just happened. 
Within 10 years, the human body will completely regenerate an entirely new skeleton. If you laid out all your blood vessels end to end, it would wrap around the earth four times. How on earth is that inside each one of us? Every fingerprint completely unique. The way that every single person walks their gait completely unique. Everyone's ear shape, everyone's tongue, everyone's iris completely unique from everyone that ever lived. You have the ability to learn. You have the ability to reason. You have an imagination. You ever thought about that? Everyone close your eyes. Think about a pink dog standing on its hind legs wearing an Arsenal top. (laughs) Why are we able to do that? (laughs) We're creative. And each of us bears his image. Genesis, it says, we were made in his image, the Imago Dei. Do you know how incredible that is? I think we lose the awe of what God has done in each and every person around us because we're just familiar with it. C.S. Lewis says, the closest you will ever be to the likeness of God is the person sitting next to you. Look at the person next to you. Okay, stop now, it's all good. (laughs) Don't let anyone take away the intricacy and beauty with which you were made. Some of you would have been hurt by friends, family, teachers, bullies, partners, called you things that would have sought to rob you of your joy, made you feel inadequate and small, worthless, or pathetic. Maybe you believe that or still do believe those things that would seek to diminish your beautiful uniqueness. And to that, I'll refer to what I said earlier. Why would a sovereign God take time to weave and embroider you together in your mother's womb? Why? He values you. He knows every single one of you. He knows every sheep. He chases after every single one and he died for every single one. This is beautiful individuality that the Bible talks about. The world did not give you your beauty and the world cannot take that away. The beauty of our individual bodies. Next, the beauty of our individual gifting. What's biblical individuality? It says we're all made individual, but then we're all gifted in a specific way. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 7, it says, There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of all of them. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's, it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. That includes you. For anyone who will become a Christian, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within them, which means what he carries can be expressed in you. How amazing is that, that God would make our hearts his home? And different gifts are given to different people in different measures, which means that there is a specificity to wit with which the gifts are given. And here I'm speaking about spiritual gifts. This is supernatural gifts that God has given you by function of you uh, accepting him as your Lord and Savior. And we believe in these gifts. The Bible speaks of these gifts. It's amazing to me that he would again take time to give us different expressions of these things. I think he gives us different measures so that no one here is self-sufficient. There's no one here that can do it on their own. We need to be codependent. It's an amazing design and idea. A, 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 A gift is given to each of us so that we can help one another. What are these gifts? I'm going to reel them off really quickly. Maybe there's one that will pertain to you. A gift of teaching, a gift of administration. 
the gift of faith, leadership, prophecy, discernment of the spirits, giving, healing, tongues, interpretation of tongues, exhortation, apostleship, miracles, evangelism, pastoring, service, help, mercy, words of knowledge, and words of wisdom. These are the gifts that we find in the scriptures. But not only uh, supernatural gifts, you're specifically gifted by way of supernatural gifts, but on the other side, there's natural talents and abilities. These are things that maybe you're born with or developed through somewhat natural means. Um, I, I, I play the bass guitar. That's something that, that's not a spiritual gift. Uh, you don't find the spiritual gift of playing the bass guitar in the scriptures. But it's a gift. Did I have to work? Yeah. <laughs> Did I have to practice? Yeah. So how is it a gift? Well, because it's funded by something called grace. Grace, yes, the saving power of God, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. But grace is also God's empowering presence that gives us the ability to go beyond our natural ability. That's the grace I'm talking about. It happened with me and playing bass guitar, actually. When uh, I was at university, like I said, I went to study physiotherapy. My four other bandmates went to study music. So I got scared. Because their job was four to six hours a day practicing their instrument. They got really good, really quickly. My job, on the other hand, was to sit in lectures from nine to four and then go home and work. And it wasn't my job, but I also would go out every now and again, and, you know, all of that stuff. I didn't practice. In fact, my, housema my housemates were surprised when they came to my first ever show. Because it... Do you remember? Sorry, my housemates are here. They were like, what? You don't play. You don't practice. What they didn't know is that I had spent a long time praying. <laughs> Before I went to uni, I said, Lord, <laughs> I'm going to need some help. I'm not going to be able to practice like my friends, but please, somehow, by your grace, just help me to keep up. And by God's grace, it was like, hey, I'm not just like struggling on gigs. This is actually okay. I'm contributing and writing. So that is uh, a natural talent or ability that is funded and sourced by grace. So I stand there every time I play bass. Where people, oh, if, if anyone gives me a compliment, you, you, I'll go very silent because I know deep down, it's not me. <laughs> as much as I have to do with it, he has more to do with it. In the Bible, we find these stories in like the story of David when he played his instrument and demons fled or torment fled from Saul. Now, I'm sure he was good, but there's no amount of technique that can do that. Or there's a read about a man named Bezalel. I think he's the first man in scripture for the Holy Spirit to fall upon him. But he was a designer. It says he was filled with the Holy Spirit and then designed the tabernacle. So when you're reading through those books of scripture and it's talking about the tabernacle and how intricate it is, that came from someone's head. <laughs> that is a natural skill, natural ability. Again, I'm talking about the beauty of individuality. The Bible talks about the beauty of how we're intricately made. It talks about this beauty of how we are specifically gifted. Number three for you here is your personal calling. The Bible speaks about you being personally called. This is an individual thing. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, for we are his workmanship, workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So what does that mean? If we tie all three of them together, all three of those points, it means that God was thinking about you and started knitting you together. But you just, he wasn't just thinking about you anatomically, he was thinking about you by way of purpose. He was thinking, okay, I've got some good works that I need to be done in 2024. Uh, uh, Pastor Toppy's going to go on sabbatical, so we're going to need someone who might be able to step up there and, and, and preach in, in, in the meantime. So while he's knitting, he's knitting TJ together. He's like, if this guy walks with me, then he's going to be able to fill a little hole for a period of time. Mm, that's called purpose. It's a good work that was created beforehand, because he saw from beforehand. I'm talking about me because I know me, but it's the same for you. When you were born, it's because God wanted you to be his hands and feet in a specific place at specific times. And he thought about those from beforehand, which convinces me that every single person here was born on purpose, with a purpose, for a purpose. 
Let me put those slides off you. It, it says, we were created on purpose. That's, we are individually made. We were created with a purpose that's individually gifted. And we were created for a purpose that's individually called. The beauty of individuality. How beautiful is it, is it that we are individuals and known by God? And it's with that beauty of individuality that I'll now explain the distortion of individuality that we see in society. How does this beautiful thing get distorted? How does this beautiful thing become perverted? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14 to 18. It, it talks about uh, how can, uh, let me just read it for you. It says, even so the body is not made up of one but many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the ears should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of smell be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the, um, sorry, Hearing be, where is the whole body where ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed, um, placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. What Paul is depicting there is the, ga- the game of comparison that we play when it comes to our individuality. Where we look across at another member, or not member, and every now and again, there's an envy that bubbles up from the inside of us that makes us wish that we were in their position. A covetousness that is warned about in the Ten Commandments that humans seem to be susceptible to, to, to running towards. We've heard the saying that comparison is the thief of joy. And it's true. And that's point one for you on this point, by the way, comparison. How does individuality get distorted? We start comparing We start comparing ourselves to those outside. Matt preached last week on the parable of the talents. The master gives one person five talents, he gives another person two, he gives another person one. The person who got given five goes and makes five more. The person who gets given two goes and makes two more. The person who makes one goes and buries that one in the ground. I thought, what would that look like today? I'll tell you what I think it would look like today. I think the person that gets given five talents doesn't tell anyone that he was given five in the first place, but takes a picture of the five that he made and posts it on Instagram. Hey, five talents, come on. Then the person who got given two talents doesn't know that he was given five in the first place. And even though he made two talents, he looks at the five and he thinks, rah, I flopped. And he might be thinking, should I even go into work today? I've only made two. And then the person who took the one talent and buried it into the ground, he sees the Instagram post and is like, there is no way I'm going into work today. Comparison will stop you from even beginning to walk in the way or manner that God has called you to walk. The the amount of people that have forfeited what God has called them to because of a line that was heard on a podcast. I've seen it before if you're not earning x amount by the time you're 30 you need a career change oh what if god knit you together for the good work that was done at that workplace that doesn't quite i know you don't make that much but it was god's plan for you but oh no because we're comparing to what people outside are saying we forfeit what god has called us to I've seen it by way of people who have forfeited who God has called them to. And I've had many a conversation with people. Why did you break up with him? Oh, he wasn't six foot. This is real. I'm quoting real truth. Where did we get that from? Or leave them if they're not doing X, Y, or Z. It gets more sinister than that, though. People who have undergone all kinds of crazy surgeries because they're trying to keep up with the people that they've seen on social media. Tragic, tragic stories that have come out for people that are chasing something. 
But where does the chase start? It, it starts with you seeing something and saying, I need to have that. And you're comparing and you feel worse and worse and worse. And it steals your joy, but then it also steals your calling. So individuality, as beautiful as it is explained in the Bible, society is constantly speaking and shouting at us saying, you must become like this. Comparison kills. And what's it still your individuality? Number two. This is a comparison I'm more talking about outside. This second point is the worship of gifts or the worship of gifting. I'm more talking about inside the church. And I'll go very quickly on the next couple ones. But I think that individuality in gifting has been perverted because we've made idols of certain gifts. Uh, the main gifts that I believe that we've made idols out of are uh, preachers and, and uh, worship leaders. I think within church culture, capital C church culture in the West, we've, 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 we've made idols of these things to the point where the amount of times I've had conversations with people where it's like, what do you feel like God's called you to? And it's like, I don't know. Why not? Well, how are you gifted? How is God gifted? I'm not gifted at all. Really? Yeah, no, I can't. I can't really speak. What? But you do a little bit of digging. It's like, but your heart for the lost is, is unreal. Yeah, but it's not really a, where did that come from? It's come from this elevation of these, these platform gifts, almost to the point where if you're not on a platform, then it doesn't really count. That kills individuality because to each one a gift is given so that we can help others. If everyone was a preacher, no one would do the admin. <laughs> Trust me, I am terrible at admin. It's a gift of the spirit. If everyone was a singer, then where would be the evangelists? Comparison within the walls. And number three, I'll, I'll jump a little bit. But number three here is maybe the biggest one. How does individual, individuality get perverted? It's through self-idolatry. Uh... I think we did a whole sermon series on idolatry a, a couple of years ago. It's worth going back and checking because it's something that we're going to have to constantly fight against. I know I spent the last half an hour speaking to you about how fearfully and wonderfully made you are, how beautifully and intricately made you are, how unique you really are. And it's true. But the world stops there. The Bible doesn't. You're fearfully and wonderfully made and made for good works, but it's not for you. It's not for ourselves. Contrary to everything the world teaches, your uniqueness is not about you. And I'm not trying to condemn anyone or anything, but this is just something that's crept in because of the society that we're in. This whole sermon, we should be thinking, how has individualism maybe crept into my life? I said in first service, it's the thought as you come into church, and I'm guilty of being this guy once upon a time, but it's the thought of, I hope there's a word for me today. I hope they sing the song that I like today. I hope it's Feremy that's singing today. I was going to say, I hope it's not TJ preaching today, but... Now, as much as it's great, yes, you wish there's a word for you, but it's not about you. That sentence needs something else tagged to the other side of it. I hope that it blesses me today so that I can bless others. Kingdomism is not to me, but to you, Lord God. What do you want me to do? Ah, you want me to help others. So when I come on a Sunday... It's, it's not about my preferences. I've heard it. What, what, what would it look like if as you're driving into church, you decide to park further away because you know that maybe someone else, maybe a visitor might need your usual spot? Uh, what would it look like to say, you know what, purposely, I'm actually going to go and sit in Hope Screen today so someone can take my usual seat? Why would you do that? Because the heart is different. What would it look like if we were a church, a body of believers that did that? 
that the whole point of our individuality was unto Jesus Christ, was unto him. The world wants our identity to be defined, sorry, it wants our identity to be our value. It was sorry, our individuality to be our identity. That's what the world wants. But our identity is not wrapped up in that. It's covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. We operate on an entirely different system. So point number three, and I'm going to bring it into a landing here. And I want to be a bit more practical with this point because we've talked doctrinally in a few of the sermons. I want to be practical. How do we live in a way that celebrates our individuality? Celebrates your uniqueness, yet prioritizes unity and togetherness. How do we live in a way that, yes, I'm an individual, but that thing has a seatbelt on it? That my whole identity and life isn't wrapped up in my uniqueness, but my identity is wrapped up in the fact that I am part of a body that is headed by the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we live like that? And I've got three quick points for you that will help you, that will help us to live like that. This point is called Better Together. Uh, point A, recognize your uniqueness. Don't suppress it. Just recognize it. Recognize that God's put some things in the inside of me. It doesn't make me better than anyone because he's put things on the inside of everyone. <laughs> But recognize what God has put on the inside of you. Some people here, you're going to find yourself in a category where you don't believe that you're gifted at all. You are. Some people are going to be here and you believe that your gifting is your personality. You know, you're going to believe that, oh yes, I'm, I'm valuable because I'm gifted in this way. No, nope. he loved you before all of that. Ask yourself the question, how has God equipped me? And I've got four really simple things to think about to look at how God might want you to walk in purpose in your life. Number one, think about how has God burdened me? What are the burdens in life? And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, your parking ticket. As much as that might be a burden, that's not the kind of burden I'm talking about. When I say how has God, I'm talking about what are the things that burden God's heart that really burden your heart as well? What are the things that irk you and move you to a point of frustration and maybe even anger that it, it, it doesn't seem that other people get irked in the same way as you? It doesn't seem that other people get pushed and pulled in the same way as you. What are those things? And these are negative things, negative areas of society that God might be tugging your heart to pour light into. Uh, I always use my wife as an example, but she is so much better at like noticing homeless people than I am. Just, I don't know why I'll be walking and talking and talking and talking and I turn to the left and it's like she's speaking to a homeless dude and asking what he wants from the shops. It's, it's something that it, it burdens her in a way that it's different to, it burdens her in a different way to how it burdens me. Uh, I've got an example of this. I, I, a burden in my life that I'll share with you is um, people that don't have fathers, people that don't have present fathers. Uh, people younger than me, normally. Um, I think I know why I'm burdened in this way. Don't worry, my dad was present. Um, but I think that, that was it. All my friends had terrible relationships with their fathers. And I didn't. And I don't know where I'd be if I didn't have that relationship with my dad. I genuinely don't know where I'd be. And so I had like survivor's guilt back in school. But I didn't want to talk about my relationship with my dad. And it used, to, it used to be like, what is, like, it used to, and to be honest, it still does get to me. But the question is, what do you do with that burden? Am I going to sit down and complain or am I going to try and be a father to the fatherless? How has God burdened you? Nehemiah is a great example of that. The people came to tell him that the wall had crumbled down and he was the one that broke down crying a morning and went to do something about it. The people that came to tell him were from the same place as him. But he was burdened. How has God burdened you? That's the question. Number two, passions. Recognize the passions. This is like the positive side of burdens. Is there something that's good? 
that is aligned with scriptures that you just have an affinity for. Like, I love music and always have, and I'm part of a somewhat musical family. Are you the kind of person that is artistic? Are you the kind of person that just loves numbers or loves caring for people or loves design or you're someone that just loves, maybe you're just someone that really loves driving people from A to B. For some reason, it's just in you. It's a passion. I love it. How can that be maneuvered and used for the glory of God? You guys still with me? All right. Number three, gifts. We've spoken about gifts already. But ask yourself, how have I been gifted? How have I been gifted? How has God gifted me? In terms of natural abilities and talents, in terms of spiritual gifts. And how can that, again, be leveraged to help others? A spiritual gift is given to each of us in order to help others, not in order to just, you know, make ourselves look great. And with your gifting, you can do one of three things. Either you build the kingdom, you benefit others, sorry, you benefit yourself, or you neglect it altogether. Either you build the kingdom, you benefit yourself, or you neglect it altogether. My suggestion would be, once discovering your gift, build the kingdom. Build other people. Amen? And I've got one more that's not on your notes, but write it down. What are your surroundings? Where has God placed you? Where has God placed you? Where's your workplace? What country are you in? What is the area that you can affect for his goodness? How can you use how you've been uniquely crafted to uniquely touch an area? Cool? Second bit of practical, how do we live in a way between individuality and togetherness? We must be devoted to one another. We must be devoted to one another. Uh, like I said earlier, our individuality needs a seatbelt. What do I mean by that? If we aren't kept on the ground, we will conform to the world. Uh, we will become, our identity will become the thing that we're good at. It happens to greater people than me. <laughs> where you're gifted in a certain area, but because there's not the, and here's the word, accountability, you're able to fly off in whatever direction. Because gifting will take you far in the world. Accountability is the practice of being held to a certain standard. What am I saying? I'm saying as beautiful an individual that you are, you need to be accountable to someone. To, to more than one person, I would say, actually. I think there's three different people that you need to have this kind of a relationship with. And I've given them three distinct names. The first kind of friend that you need is the jug. I'll explain. A jug is a, a jug pours into things, right? Everyone needs a jug in their life. Someone that is predominantly pouring into them. This is a bit more of a one-way relationship, where this person's probably older than you, been walking with the Lord a bit longer than you. Uh, this is someone that disciples you. Someone that you seek out and ask for their advice. This person's not there to put out the fires in your life. They're there to take away the matches from you. We all need to be accountable to someone. We all need a jug in our lives. We are not sufficient on our own. God loves us so much that he gave us limitations knowing that we need to lean on other people we need what Jethro was to Moses, someone that is able to sit us down and say, hey, I've been down this road before. There's a different way to do it. Number two, the second friend that we need is what I've called the knife. The person that is going to sharpen you as you sharpen them. Proverbs 27, 17, like iron sharpens iron, let one man sharpen another. These are your peers. This person isn't, or these people aren't necessarily older than you. They're not necessarily further along the line than you. In fact, they're probably around the same season of life as you. But we need these quote unquote knives in our life because we need to be sharpened. Someone that can catch you in the middle and say, hey, 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 nah, I'm going to help you in this situation. Don't go left, go right. The kind of people you can stand with and pray with. Do you have a prayer partner? Do you have people that you pray with? I didn't, this wasn't a part of my life for years. Until the last couple of years, I've got a couple of friends that I stand with and pray with. It's changed so much in my life. We need knives. Spiritual ones. Jug, knife, last one. So that's someone's going to clip that and just... <laughs> post it on instagram that'll be bad um the last one we need is a cup this is someone that we pour into 
someone that's probably younger, someone that you're going to be the jug for. This is the one that's often forgotten and neglected, especially in an individualistic society where it's all about me and my personal growth. How are we helping those around us to grow? I'm not saying I have to sit down with them and just, you know, go through lamentations with them or anything like that. But is there someone that you can just be generous to? Someone that you can look out for? Someone you can just give a quick call and just see how they're doing? Like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, follow me as I follow Christ. And is everyone still with me? Van, do you want to come up? I'm going to close with this last bit. We must be devoted to one another, but ultimately we must be devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. We must be devoted to his word, which means... Uh, you, you read this book. We are part of a body, but are, we are growing into the fullness of him who is the head. That's what it says in Ephesians. Um, we must know what the head says. We need to know what the head says. If we are to function as a mature body, we must be devoted to his word. Number two, we must be devoted to his ways. His way is love, which means any time that we are exercising, gifting, or individuality, we do not lord it over people. We use these gifts in order to help one another. Each and every person that we can help, that is what we do. And number three, we must be devoted to his mission. Like I said, I spent a lot of time talking about individual purpose, which is a bit of a strange sermon especially in an individual society. And I do believe in individual purpose, but individual purpose is completely subordinate to his purpose, the corporate purpose. We fit into his mission. He doesn't fit into our mission. His mission is this, his statement over your life. Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself and make disciples of all nations. Everything that I've spoken about today fits into those three things. Every gift, uh, uh, when we're trying to close worship, it all fits into those three things. If you're here looking for purpose, that's where you should start. We're going to close in a second. Why don't you stand up? I know we're a bit over time. I'm going to pray for you and then we can go. But I'll pose that question to you again. What does it look like when we have a whole church congregation, a whole body that is completely devoted to him? And in our devotion to him, we are devoted to one another. What does that really look like? How does society really change when a church drops their agenda and becomes completely all about Jesus Christ? If you're here and you're looking for purpose, this is where you start. You start by giving your life to Jesus. And you get baptized and you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. You love your neighbor as yourself. And you go and you make disciples of all nations. Why don't you close your eyes? I'm going to pray. Jesus, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the truth of your word, Lord God, that not a single person here is a mistake. That each and every person here is loved by you, Lord. Lord, loved more than they could ever know by you. Loved so much that you died for them on the cross. We thank you, King Jesus. And Lord, as we go about our weeks, Lord God, I pray that we would use the knowledge and security of how much you love us in order to help others. Those who do wrong to us, let us do right to them, Lord God, because we know that we are loved by you. Would you be our source and our strength, Lord God? Be our shield, we pray, Lord God. As we live lives trying to be a living sacrifice by your Holy Spirit, would it be done, Lord God? Would we be a generation, a touched generation, a new generation of people that live completely sold out for you, Lord God? Be glorified, be blessed, be with us as we go. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Have a great week, everyone.